I have previously referenced the book of Daniel chapter 7 that describes four beasts arising out of the sea. And we've talked about and focused upon the fourth of these beasts before. Now, I want to just go back and uh, reiterate or or, or restate uh, this beast uh, as we saw previously. This is from Daniel 7, verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceeding strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And we had talked about the three previous ones. And it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Then he speaks of how judgment is given to the saints against this beast, just like I was speaking about in the last broadcast. Uh, I just want to pause and read this one small bit because it should remind you of the opening sequences in the book of Revelation, the fourth chapter, when Jesus is introduced to John in his vision in the book of Revelation. He said, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one which shall never be destroyed. Now, you will that sounds very much like the song of praise to Jesus, uh, recorded in the book of Revelation, the fourth chapter, which says, Worthy is the Lamb, fourth and fifth chapter, to receive honor and glory and praise because you died, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation, and made them a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So there's a striking parallel between this scene in Daniel and the scene that opens in heaven before John in the fourth and fifth chapters of the book of Revelation. Now, uh, Daniel was obsessed, I don't think that's too strong a term, Um, he was obsessed with this fourth beast that he saw. And he was grieved in his spirit. Uh, And so we'll go on. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all of this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts are four, and four kings will arise out of the earth. So four kingdoms and four kings. But the fifth kingdom, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. This tracks perfectly what is said in the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, which says, in the midst of the shaking, 
but you have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken in as much as all these kingdoms shall be shaken. All right? But he was obsessed, as I said, with the meaning of the fourth beast. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different. Note that it was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke into pieces, and trampled the residue with its feet and ten horns that were on his head, and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely the horn which had eyes and a mouth that spoke, spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was waging war against the saints and prevailing against them, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom." Now this is what was said. Then he said to me, he gave the interpretation, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth which will be different from all other kingdoms and will devour, means the word is about exercising hegemony, it will dominate, devour the whole earth, trampling it and breaking it into pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time, but the court will be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High God. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account, and for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Now, one thing uh, that I want to point out here about this kingdom, I want to point out a couple of things. It does not say that this kingdom wages war against the saints. Who wages war against the saints using this kingdom? Ah, that's the difference, you see. The kingdom itself has an hegemony over the whole earth. This is very important because of what I'm about to reveal to you about the nature of this kingdom. Because there's a lot of talk about um, creating alternative financial and social systems and the like. And many are already proposing what those systems might look like. And it's part of the intent to spread terror because of an inexact reading of the scriptures. It says, verse 21 of Daniel 7, 
I was watching and the same horn was waging war against the saints. The saints being uh, God's interest in the earth, the people of God. It's the horn that is waging war against the saints and prevailing against them. Now, keep in mind, and I am keeping in mind, there's a reference to this person in the New Testament. He's referred to as the prince of the power of the air, whose power is that of deception. In other words, the power of the air is sound, the way that you make sounds, a message. And that message, in its content, is referred to as lies and deception, the conveying of lies and deception that will have the ability to deceive those who do not love the truth, if it were possible. These sounds made by this horn that is speaking perversities in an environment that utilizes the power of this kingdom that has global hegemony will deceive those who do not love the truth. Now it's clear that the power of this kingdom will affect every aspect of human life. But there's a spokesman, there's a message, frankly, that attempts to utilize the environments of this kingdom for the purpose of conveying a message of terror and subjugation. So, be extremely careful. Do not be deceived. When Jesus was speaking about this particular phenomenon, he said in Matthew 24 and, uh, uh, and again in uh, Mark 13 and Luke 21, he said, many false Christs will arise who will claim legitimacy in my name, but they will deceive many. Why? Because they will use the circumstances that exist to promote fear in the people, in the name of Christ. In which case, they will not be speaking for Christ. They will be speaking in furtherance of their own interest. It goes on to say, in the same passage in Matthew, Mark and Luke that I've referenced, that many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Now, why are people deceived? According to 1 Thessalonians, they are deceived because they do not love the truth. And according to 1 Timothy, people are deceived because they have itching ears and they have prevailing lusts and they're looking for and listening for sounds that agree with what they lust for. And these are the ones who are subject to deception. Jesus described the same type of person in his time as, quote, seeing and not seeing, hearing and not hearing. What is the condition of a person who sees but doesn't see? who hears but doesn't hear. 
It's someone who wants to hear only what he wants to hear and someone who wants to see only what he wants to see. And beside that, he will see nothing or hear nothing. So people who are deceived by this voice that speaks blasphemous things, supported by supported by the existing conditions in the world among mankind at that time in this kingdom that I'm about to describe to you, the message of this kingdom to all but those who have ears to hear, eyes to see, will be a deceptive message. So watch for people in this time whose messages are rooted in fear, in escapism, in self-provision, and in methodologies for surviving that do not require you to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ as one who is a subject of His kingdom. These are the templates that you should use to decide whether this plethora of prophetic messages, everyone giving these messages claiming to be a prophet, these are the four measures by which you should judge these things. Do they promote fear? Do they rely on what you can do? Do they require you to submit to the sovereignty of Christ? Or is it still about the sweat of your brow, what you can do in conjunction with others to save yourself? If these messages all have that taste and sound to them, reject them because they're not from God, because they do not promote what God is promoting, which is the utilization of these times to bring a people to maturity suddenly. So he talks about how the horn was waging war against the saints. And then it goes on, um, and again he talks about it, where he says, uh, the... This horn, verse, 20, verse 24, ten horns are ten kings who will arise from this kingdom. This is when he's giving the interpretation, before he just referenced that the horn was waging war against the saints. The ten horns are ten kings who will arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. So there's a, there's a sequence of the arising he shall be different from the first ones. He will subdue three kings and he shall speak, he, this horn, uh, this king, shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and laws." The saints shall be given into his hand for time, times, and half a time. So again, I'm making the distinction that I think to be critically important in light of what I want to talk about this kingdom as being. And that is that it's the, it's the message that comes at this time that is oppressive to the saints. It's the message that wages war against the saints. It's the one who speaks this message. Now, you will see the same reference in uh, in the book of uh, Revelation, the 13th chapter. And it, there's a striking resemblance in this reading to the book of Daniel. Pardon me. <coughs> Pardon me. To the book of Daniel. Even to the point of the sea. 
verse 1 of chapter 13 of the book of Daniel. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, <coughs> pardon me, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. So, first the word sea here um, is a metaphorical reference to the sea of humanity. The multiple usages and references to the word sea um, one of them, and it's a different Greek word altogether, is a reference to sea as people uh, understand the, the ocean and the seas. Um, another reference is, uh, again, to the sea of humanity. Uh, this one is subject to that interpretation as in the sea of humanity. Out of that a beast arises. I saw a beast rising up, having seven heads. So this is a detail that Daniel did not have. Daniel said this beast had ten horns. This one says it had seven heads and ten horns. So the number of the horns is still the same, but now we know that these ten horns sit on seven heads. And on his head, ten horns, on, on, and on his horns, ten crowns. That would, be signif that would signify ten rulers and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. So you'll remember that in Daniel's uh, reference, uh, the first beast he saw was like a lion. The middle beast he saw was like a bear, and the third uh, beast he saw was like a leopard. Uh, John's vision is the reverse, a leopard, a bear, and a lion. That's because in Daniel's time, he's looking prospectively into history, and the nearest beast to him in the chronology of the events is a, a lion, the nearest kingdom of a predatory nature is a lion. Further in time from Daniel's point in history is the bear, and furthest away from him and closest to the beast is the leopard. Now Daniel has spoken and John when he recalls this vision he sees them in the reverse because the one closest to where he's standing in history is the leopard. Further back and closer to, to Daniel is the bear and closest back to Daniel but furthest back from John is the lion. So that tells us something. It tells us that three of these predecessors have already occurred, which is my point. My point is to suggest that every fulfillment of prophetic scripture is the only fulfillment of prophetic scripture is nonsense. Because here you have three successors each of which is a predatory type, a type of kingdom 
that is predatory. So as between John in the New Testament and Daniel in the Old Testament, three predatory kingdoms had already arisen. What is happening here? A momentum is being built in human culture for the emergence of this final beast. Now, the rollout of this beast begins in the time of Jesus and John. But to suggest that it has culminated and therefore we don't have to be concerned about it because it's now an historical fact is to simply not understand the nature of this beast. You notice there were, there were prior kings to it and subsequent kings. So it's an historically progressing kingdom which will reach its culmination in the end of the age. But what is it? Before we come to it, we must understand again that its purpose is to compete with the saints, to have a competing message with the saints and to oppress humanity, to force them into an alignment with the philosophy of this kingdom. Now we have immediately assumed that every aspect of this kingdom uh, results in death and bloodshed. Not necessarily so. What is the most valuable aspect of any kingdom? Its citizens. This kingdom has a goal of attracting the widest number, the largest possible number of subjects. To kill everybody is counterproductive. It's not what kingdoms do. In war, kingdoms will overcome and kill certain of the subjects of another kingdom, but the goal always is to subjugate, not necessarily to destroy, and destroys only that which is necessary to to establish its hegemony. And this kingdom is no different in that regard. The focus of the conflict of kingdoms is in the messaging because the messaging holds the key to the culture of each kingdom. Now, here at the very end of this broadcast, I want to use the word that describes this kingdom and then we'll proceed to dive into it. The word that describes this kingdom in the scriptures is the word cosmos, K-O-S-M-O-S, cosmos. John speaks about it. He says, do not love the cosmos, do not love the world, or the things of the world. Whoever loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now the cosmos, in historic reference, in the Greek, is referred to as an adornment or an arrangement. And the implication is of systems on which human life relies and depends. Now, I want to unpack that word, cosmos, and I specifically want to focus on the one who originated it, the Cosmocrato, the God of this world. For we're told not to love this world. It is not a reference to geography, not a reference to humanity, for God so loved the world but it is a reference 
to a particular type of kingdom that has in mind to subjugate all mankind by deception. Let's get into that in the next session. I'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.